The membership has happened. After holding the member state status since the year 2005, Iran has become a permanent member of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. What will that mean for the bloc, and will this bloc with Iran's addition stand up to the West, in particular when it comes to trade and security? Hi, I'm Kavit Ahwai. Coming up in today's program, the SCO, a regional organization in the heart of Asia, whose members account for one-fifth of the global GDP, two-fifths of the world's population, and three-fifths of the Eurasian landmass. Now, Iran's President Ebrahim Rahisi, on his first maiden foreign trip, was welcomed with SCO membership. Not a bad start. Countering sanctions and increasing trade now more likely for the country. Also coming up in this program, does the SCO now spell a concern for the U.S.? That is something the U.S. needs to think of. Is this the end of U.S. unilateralism? Now the SCO has Iran, China, and Russia on its list, all targeted by the U.S. through sanctions and maximum pressure policy. Has the U.S.-China containment received the blow? A regional organization in the heart of Asia, whose members account for one-fifth of the global GDP, two-fifths of the world's population, and three-fifths of the Eurasian landmass. Such is the combined value of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's nine full members. China, India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and now Iran. Iran, Saeed Ibrahim Raisi. Premier. Minister of the Chinese People's Republic, Wang Yi. The group did have four observers, Mongolia, Afghanistan, Belarus, and Iran, but Iran is no longer part of that grouping. And the SEO has started procedures to admit Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Qatar as new dialogue partners. Given the enormous extent of geographical coverage, amounting to 35 million square kilometers, and a population as high as 3.15 billion people, the organization has been known to be the greatest producer and the greatest consumer of energy at the same time on a global scale. The organization Over its 20-year existence, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has been mostly seen as a form for security cooperation to combat extremism, separatism, and terrorism. But now, trade and banking are more dominant concerns. In 2001, China and other members of the SCO have made considerable economic and commercial progress in the last 20 years. Annual trade volume has increased by 20 times in 2020. A favorable environment for trade and investments and achieving free flow of goods, capitals, services and technologies, especially in the post-era of the COVID-19 pandemic, has become more of a priority issue. These have all been stipulated in the organization's charter. The process of expansion for the SCO was a natural outcome for the organization waiting to happen. But this occurred years ago, and it appears more nations will follow. Russia and China are the economic powerhouses of the SCO. Some achievements of that organization is that its total GDP reached $16.6 trillion in the year 2017, 
while approaching EU's 17.1 trillion US dollars and accounting for almost 25%, close to 21% actually, of global GDP. Well, the SEO is expected to surpass the US in the year 2022. And by 2022, China's total economy will be around $15 trillion, and the proportion of SEO's economies will reach about 26%. So that says quite a lot. Well, joining us for this segment, we have Andre Loing. He is an international and independent China strategist. He's had decades of experience as a senior Hong Kong government official in a variety of fields, including finance, industry, social welfare, and overseas representation. Andre, welcome. The SEO countries, some of the stats covering one-fourth of the Earth's land and nearly half of the human population, a regional organization in the heart of Asia, members accounting for one-fifth of the global GDP, two-fifths of the world's population, and three-fifths of Eurasian land mass. What is the economic capacity of this organization, and has it reached its full potential? Well, of course, the, in the organization, um, the role of China and the and economic size of China uh, overshadows uh, everything else. Don't forget that um, in a different organization called the BRICS, uh, uh, China, uh, Brazil, Russia, and India, China's economy is the sum total, is bigger than the sum total of the rest combined. As you uh, right, right, rightly pointed out, um, the organization has been um, pushing below its weight. Uh, but I think the time has come. Uh, for the organization to adopt a, a much larger role uh, with the change in Afghanistan. Okay, thank you for that. We appreciate it, Andre. Uh, let's now take a look at uh, more information about the SCO. It's uh, a lot that encompasses this grouping of countries, and the next piece will enlighten you on that. It's time now for our info news section of the program. This is where we try to focus on economic news and social news that usually don't make it into mainstream media. Now, our first story occurs in the UK. The headline read, UK empty shelves, a crisis that isn't just down to COVID-19 and Brexit. It's been decades in the making. Now, that's something that many perhaps are not aware of. It went on to say that ever worsening conditions in supply chain jobs have made Britain's shortages inevitable and a pay rise for lorry drivers won't end them. Now, you combine that with a labor sh crisis, you bet the UK is worried. Next up, we'll go to the US. Nine million Americans just got the rug pulled out from under them when enhanced pandemic federal unemployment benefits expired there. Now, workers in this country aren't lacking work ethics. They're saying they simply don't have reliable childcare, healthcare, or economic infrastructures to support them in times of crises. Now, while this has happened, COVID-19 is still raging on in that country. So pulling the benefits from these Americans is not coming at a good time. Moving on to China, uh, officially applying to the uh, Asia-Pacific Free Trade Pact. The CPTPP was, um, it joined that and it inked it. In um, 2018, you had 11 countries, including Australia, Canada, Chile, Japan, and New Zealand that joined it which uh, in the accord represent nearly half a billion consumers, counting for 13.3% of the global GDP. Now, the trade agreement is essentially an updated version of the ill-fated Trans-Pacific Partnership, if you remember that. 
Finally, we go to Sri Lanka, a state of emergency declared there. There's an economic slump. There are food shortages in that country, so bad that the military was deployed to stop the citizens hoarding food amidst shortages of essential goods. The prices of food, including rice, milk, and cereals, have tripled in some areas due to inflation, while many shelves in the government-run supermarkets in the capital, Colombo, are empty. This is our in-depth section where we take a deeper look at today's topic, SEO's economic perspective. Now, in order to get an idea about where the SEO stands compared to the rest of the world, that's our main focus now, let us take a look at this map. Now, this map here is a breakdown of the SEO in terms of uh, the ones that are members, which is in red, the ones who are observers, that's in orange, and the ones who are attendants, they call it attendants. And you could see uh, those uh, members, which comprise, are comprising those three categories. Uh, China, India, uh, and Russia, for example, are three of the major members. Of course, Iran, as you can see over here, Iran now is a permanent member, uh, something that obviously uh, is a milestone because Iran uh, had the observer status since the year 2005. Now, the ones remaining in that grouping are Mongolia, Afghanistan, and Belarus. Also uh, noteworthy is to talk about uh, the uh, dialogue partners, which Turkey is in that grouping. And then, uh, more importantly, you have another development. Uh, SCO has started procedures to admit Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Qatar as new dialogue partners. So it's noteworthy to mention that here. Now, our guest, Andre Long, talked about the China Belt and Road Initiative. Take a look at this. Uh, it's good to have your memories refreshed if you haven't uh, taken a look at this. This is basically the China's Belt and Road Initiative, which represents uh, China's Chinese President Xi Jinping's grand vision, uh, which obviously, as you can see in this map, it starts from China, for example, and you have the breakdown here in the colors. Black are the land routes that from China goes all the way through and is a gateway as you can see, covering uh, countries like Pakistan, like Iran, all the way through to Turkey, and it's a gateway to Europe. And then you have the uh, maritime networks, which start again from China, for example, from Fuzhou, port there in the green. Uh, these are all the different ports that it encompasses in this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Again, Iran being one of the major uh, connecting points between the Far East and then into going into Europe. So you could see how that Regional integration is what's important. It increases trade and it stimulates economic growth. Okay, now let's take a look at this map. This map is very important. And the reason why this map is, is important uh, uh, is uh, something that maybe you no did not hear about on the one hand, but we're going to tell you right here on Economic Divide. And it's the Polar Silk, Silk Road, uh, usually not mentioned in the uh, Silk Road Initiative by China. This is the Polar Silk Road, this one area in the black, which goes around all the way through on top of uh, uh, Russia coming through here, which leads onto Europe. So you can see this is very important. Again, something that's not mentioned, it's called the Polar Silk Roads. Um, and again, the Belt and Road Initiative, important because it's a gateway to Europe uh, and beyond. And these are the others that we just uh, mm, covered in the previous map which are the uh, maritime routes and, of course, the, the land routes. So uh, I want to now shock you with something, and it's this map. This map, it's an old map, but take a look at it. The world divided in half. You got the uh, eastern side, I'm sorry, the western side, and then you have the eastern side. This is the eastern side comprised of Africa, uh, for example, West Asia, and uh, Asia. This is where most of the trade way back uh, occurred. It was the center of global trade in terms of economic activity. So you see the concentration here as opposed to what you see over here, which is the West. For example, uh, the US is part of this. So taking a look at this concentration gives you an idea uh, about the way that the trade volume way in, uh, in the past was focused in this area and in this region of the world. Now, these facts cannot be ignored. We're going to talk about now the facts about uh, the SCO in terms of what it comprises. Over 60% of the world's land mass uh, uh, covers the SCO countries cover. And this is a leading institution that says that more than one third of the world's population, 
Again, a very important fact to give you a depth about the SEO. Also, we need to mention how it uh, has nearly 45% of the world's energy reserves. Again, very important. And also, it's a combined economy that nearly equals the U.S. gross domestic product. So the SCO, when you take a look at those uh, figures, has significant influence over the world's economy and security. Moreover, the SCO is an organization exclusive of uh, the U.S., which may potentially threaten U.S.'s security and interests. So this question can't be ignored. Shouldn't the U.S. be concerned by the SCO? Now, for a breakdown, uh, professor and political analyst uh, with an economic flair, Mohamed Mirandi joins us. He's a lecturer at the University of Tehran, and he's appeared on numerous media outlets, such as Al Jazeera, such as RT, and also we can mention TRT World. And he joins us now to give us his insight and analysis on this. Professor Mirandi, welcome. The SEO meeting this year has admitted Iran finally. Uh, and this admission, uh, you tweeted, that Iran's membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is another major setback for the U.S. regime. It shows that the U.S. did not have enough influence to convince a single government to block Iran's entry. It's also good news for all of Iran's allies. Can or does the SCO, now Iran has joined it, have the ability to stand up to the West? And will the SCO be able to economically, through trade, stand up to the West? Well, SCO countries collectively are more powerful than Western countries. And as the balance of power tilts away from Western countries, I think uh, Asia will become even more powerful, comparatively speaking, than today in the near future. The United States and its allies have antagonized Iran, Russia, China, and other countries. They are the ones who've created uh, so many adversaries for themselves because they want to be uh, the hegemon over global affairs. And now that uh, they've done this, now that they've antagonized so many countries, this has created a, an enormous incentive for countries that are constantly being attacked by the United States to cooperate more than before. So three important countries, China, Russia, and Iran, which have uh, confronted American imperial ambitions and have been on the receiving end of U.S. hostility, uh, they are moving closer together and the SCO provides an opportunity to even strengthen that convergence even further. The 21st meeting of the Council of Heads of States of the SCO has been held in Tajikistan. This year marked the 20th anniversary of the organization's founding. The Chinese President Xi Jinping called on member states of the SCO to strengthen solidarity and cooperation and build a closer SCO community with a shared future. Iran was finally approved as a member in his first trip overseas. Ibrahim Raisi welcomed Iran's admission, he said that diplomacy is one of the means to ensure national interests of the countries. Diplomacy is one of the means to ensure national interests of countries. It is efficient when all sides remain committed to their obligations in practice. Threatening and pressuring other sides weaken diplomacy. When it comes to Iran's membership at the SCO, this comes at a crucial time due to the JCPOA and Iran nuclear talks. Iran's president has said that Iran's economy and economic progress will not be tied to the outcome of the talks if it did not yield the desired results for Iran. The world is entering a new era with a new order. Domination and unilateralism are on the decline. International order is moving toward multipolarization and redistribution of power in favor of independent states. Iran has said that the best solution would be to find intra-regional banking and monetary mechanism to help independent countries deflect illegal U.S. sanctions and pave the way for securing free trade by taking advantage of national currencies 
or by defining a specific currency as a suitable alternative for the U.S. dollar, something that SCO members are doing. 不能从所谓实力地位出发，推行霸权、霸道、霸凌，应该以联合国宪章宗旨和原则为遵循。坚持共商、共建、共享，要践行真正的多边主义，反对打着所谓规则旗号破坏国际秩序、制造对抗和分裂的行径。要恪守互利共赢的合作观，拆除割裂贸易、投资、技术的高墙壁垒。营造包容普惠的发展前景。The SEO economies, as explained, make up a major portion of the world economy. But the world economy itself, after the pandemic, is changing in terms of which countries are contributing the most to economic output. Now, SEO as a whole makes up around 25% of the world's economic output, and as countries like China, Russia, and India, and even Iran progress economically, which are projected to be、uh, the case, the economic output of the East will then eventually outpace the West, in particular the EU and the US. Now, let's not forget that Qatar and Saudi Arabia are also being considered for joining the organization, which will expand the organization and world GDP. As a consequence, now both of our guests rejoin us for this final Q and A of the program. Professor Mohammed Marandi. We also have Andre Long, international and independent China strategist, rejoining us. Professor Marandi, I'm going to first start with you.、Uh, the SCO countries, in terms of、uh, the relevance, in terms of the stats, some of them, one fourth of the Earth's land, half of the human population.、Um, it's a regional organization, the heart of Asia. And in terms of the global GDP, counting for one fifth of that,、um, we're looking at Iran to have joined it. A host of countries now, amongst them Russia and China, as you're well aware.、Uh, do you think that the economic potential of the SCO has been reached, especially now that Iran has joined it? Iran's membership、uh, in this organization creates a, an important opportunity for Iran to expand. Its、uh, trade and business and cooperation, both political and economic,、uh, with Asian countries. We know that Western countries are on the decline, and the、uh, rise of Asia is visible for everyone to see.、Uh, Iran is critical in sent in West Asia. It is the most important power in Western Asia, so it can contribute a great deal. To the integration of the continent as a whole, but also、uh, these countries, countries like China, Russia, and other members of the、uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization,、uh, ha- can help Iran al- as well to、uh, decrease the capabilities to put pressure on Iran. So. They, all these countries need one another, and as Asia rises and as Western countries decline, this is a, an important and historic moment. Okay, Andrew Long, let me uh, uh, turn to you. This is an important point that I'd like to make. In、uh, 2017, you had India and Pakistan becoming the official members.、Um, Iran is now a member, and the primary go- goal of this group is to reduce the risk of conflict between SCO member states. At least that was one of their charters. Uh, joining the fight against the three evils: terrorism, extremism, and separation. But you also have this China,、uh, China One Belt、uh, project, which connects these countries. But the U.S. is on a confrontational path with China. Is the U.S. then a threat to these countries、uh, and their ambitious economic goals? Well, I don't think the United States has, um, uh, has the appetite、uh, or the resources、uh, to build a big.、Um, Conductivity projects like the Belt and Road,、um, but、um, as far as the don't forget that India is part of the SCO members,、um, and India and China do not see eye to eye always. 
Uh, but nevertheless, it's a member of the SEO, um, and it's a uh, India is not a total ally of the United States either because of this uh, 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 kind of uh, nuanced, um, non-aligned um, foreign policy. Uh, Andre Luong speaking there, international independent China strategist, and also like to thank Professor and political analyst Mohamed Morandi, who gave us his uh, thoughts and input into this uh, program on the SCO. Uh, at this point, uh, I'll be back in our next segment with my final thoughts. There's no denying it, the SCO is now a relevant organization in the world, from trade to security, i.e. fighting extremists and terrorists, especially when it comes to a country like Afghanistan. Now, this block of countries stands smack on the face of the U.S., which wants to pursue China economically and militarily. Countries that are in China's sphere, who have been aided through loans for the execution of China's Belt and Road Initiative, especially countries that have been hit by harsh U.S. sanctions like Iran, will stand in the way of U.S. unilateralism. There are even talks of establishing a new monetary system to bypass the Western-controlled SWIFT banking system, like between Russia and Iran. That does it for this edition of the program. Your questions and comments are always welcome. It was great to have you with us. From Mikha Vitavoy and the entire team, it's goodbye.